Welcome to the talk about uh, Kral and GPU offload. Uh, here's the talk agenda. Uh, so we split the talk into two parts. Uh, the, first talk, uh, the first part will be given by me, and it will be about um, Truffle EST and the Kral IR part, sort of how do we convert dynamic languages into Kral IR, and also what is the current status of Kral. And um, the second part will be given by Vasant from EMD, uh, and it will be done on how CrawlRR is offloaded uh, to the GPU. So, as for my part here, um, well, some disclaimer. Uh, I'm an Oracle Labs uh, employee, uh, so we have a special disclaimer actually uh, now, which says that uh, we are doing research and not products. Uh, and in particular, also anything I say is um, just my own humble opinion. And um, yeah, this just as a, as a small disclaimer. Uh, nevertheless, I, I'd like in the rest of my talk, make sure that you still believe that what you're doing here is not a phantasm, right? Um, so, Kral uh, has been around now for uh, a little bit more than one year as an OpenJDK project. And, um, so Kral is a dynamic compiler written in Java for the JVM. It has um, two modes of operation. Uh, this is something new over the last year, actually. One is the meta-circular configuration, where Kral would actually be able to run as the only JIT compiler in the VM. Uh, it's meta-circular because in this case, Kral would compile itself before it can actually run programs. Um, you can see here that, uh, yeah, well, Kral is written in Java, and there is some interface to Hotspot, which is written in C++. Um, the second configuration on the right is actually more important in the context of, for example, GPU offload, uh, because there, Kral is just, it's just a Java program that happens to be a compiler. Uh, so it's, it's really like, you can start Hotspot with any compiler configuration you like, client, server, interpreter only, and have Graal run as a user program. And then you can in, like, invoke Graal to compile, for example, your Lambda, your Clojure, your stream um, API function, and use Graal only for this specific part to compile, and use the results from Graal to execute uh, on the GPU. We use this configuration actually also for executing uh, dynamic languages on the GPU, uh, but more to that uh, later. Uh, well, I will give you a few performance numbers. Uh, I will not bore you with technical details about Crawl. Uh, um, I'm happy to like, elaborate to anybody who wants uh, some more uh, like in the break, but uh, I just want to show that, that our approaches are uh, also viable from a performance point of view. Uh, here I show uh, a pure Java peak performance measurement uh, using SpecGVM 2008. And I measure here Graal against the client compiler and the server compiler. Um, so we are, we are a little bit faster than the client compiler, but we're still 14% uh, uh, or 13% uh, slower than uh, the server compiler. Well, we have quite improved a bit over the last year and uh, believe that we might actually be able to uh, close the gap at some point. Um, pure child performance, of course, is not interesting for a GVM language summit attendees. Uh, you're interested about the performance of your language. And uh, the in interesting part here is that if you measure the performance of Graal um, on non-Java workloads, like workloads that are not so typical for Java, um, like Spectrum 2008, uh, Graal is actually doing already a lot better. Uh, I'm showing here the peak performance measurement on the Scala da Capo benchmark suite, which is a, um, an assembly of um, six, seven uh, Scala programs. Uh, and you can see that uh, Graal is doing here a lot better relative to the client compiler, uh, because for Scala, the escape analysis is very important. Um, and also relative to the server compiler, uh, the gap is uh, smaller. Um, there have been uh, certain rumors that given that Graal is a Java program, uh, it's supposed to be really slow. Um, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, our compile time performance 
is better than the server compiler's compile time performance uh, that is uh, written in C++. For measuring this, we used uh, the compile the world uh, benchmark, which uh, is uh, compiling um, without inlining. So every compiler is consuming the same amount of bytecodes. Uh, it is compiling a large amount of the JDK. And, and there we are 20% faster than the server compiler. Uh, it's uh, not where we want to be in the end. Uh, we still see a lot of improvements in terms of footprint and compilation performance, but this is just to assure you that uh, we are not off the scale. And that is actually possible nowadays to run uh, system software in Java. So, uh, m more interestingly than the statically uh, typed languages are for us actually the dynamically typed languages. And here um, I've presented last year uh, the idea of using Truffle EST interpretation, um, including partial evaluation to create the compiled code. So what we do is we specialize the ESTs. At some point, the EST gets stable. And then we use crawl to directly compile these ESTs to machine code. Um, in this approach, uh, there is no bytecode generation involved. Um, so you can uh, basically just write your program in interpreter and, um, and still have the high performance. So last year we've presented the idea. Uh, now we're actually able to present some results. Uh, and results indicate that it's actually possible to get high performance on the JVM without uh, generating bytecodes. Uh, and uh, it, it shows basically that our, our approach is, is not that bad. Um, in particular, it also shows that Graal is a good compiler for dynamic languages, uh, because Graal is some of the Graal, Graal's optimizations are designed for uh, dynamic language compilation, where you have one compilation and a lot of the optimization points, a lot of guards in your uh, in your compilation. Uh, so uh, we have done performance uh, measurements of uh, Truffle plus Graal. Um, of an experimental JavaScript implementation uh, that has a completeness of 95% on ECMAScript 262 uh, versus um, Nashorn running on the server compiler. Um, so we have done peak performance measurements on the V8 suite. Uh, these are our current results. Uh, you can see on the, on the bottom the um, benchmarks of the V8 suite. Richards, Delta Blue Crypto, Raytrace, Navier Stokes, Splay, Early Boyer, uh, and then a geometric mean composite. Um, what you can basically see is that uh, Kral is doing fairly well in uh, executing here uh, a dynamic language, here in this case, JavaScript. Uh, we have some benchmarks, in particular the computationally intensive benchmarks, like Crypto Raytrace. Raytrace is a Raytrace simulator. simulator. Uh, written in JavaScript. Uh, we have very high speed ups. Um, and um, so there is one outlier here, which is Splay. Uh, Splay is a GC benchmark. It is creating uh, data structures and then measuring how fast you can um, delete the part of this data structure causing GC. Uh, and here you can see that we are uh, approximately at the same level. Um, and but on the computationally intensive benchmarks, you have huge advantages. Um, this is because for one part, Kral is doing a better job in compiling these de-optimization points. And for another part, the Truffle uh, front-end to Kral that is converting and type specializing the JavaScript program um, is uh, an important contributor to this performance. Um, uh, on such slides on JavaScript performance, there's usually the question at some point, where is V8? Um, I have not yet put up the slide on V8 because we are not yet faster. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to say still, but uh, that we are not that far off. If you run just this Truffle EST interpreter on the hotspot, you will be very, very slow because there will be no compilation taking place. Uh, so you will not run on hotspot VM at all uh, in a very good shape. You will have to run on Graal VM. As I say, the Truffle, so this is using the Truffle uh, framework, which is essentially a front end to Graal. Uh, compared to V8, yeah, we are. How much Pardon?
uh, in which configuration you're in this configuration or this configuration? So, so in the left configuration, uh, crawl is running, so the crawl itself is running on top of the server compiler or the client compiler, you can choose that. You just need some compiler. Oh, okay. um, yeah, but, but so, so this, this measurement is here running crawl in hosted mode. So crawl is not used for actually uh, compiling uh, Java. It's only used specifically for the JavaScript methods. Okay, uh, I'm, I don't know about that one. Okay. Um, so regarding uh, the latest version of V8, uh, on the composite, we are at the moment 2.2x behind. Um, in any case, we believe that this is a new step and a significant enhancement of dynamic language performance on the JVM and has the potential to get into the range of specialized JavaScript VMs like V8. Yeah. So you, you basically believe that invoke dynamic compile code are on the, a friend in the history at this point when you look at the stuff of architecture? Um, I didn't say that. If this is the message that was transported, I will leave it there. Uh, what, I, what I say, what I, what I basically say is that the Truffle frontend to crawl is giving you a huge performance advantage for dynamic language execution at GVM. And the Truffle frontend is actually already out there, open source, as part of the crawl project. So any language implementer who wants to use the Truffle framework can do so as of now. So uh, anyway, uh, to get back to the GPU offload uh, topic, um, there have been other things added to Kral over the last year. And um, so uh, we have additional backends. One is Spark, uh, which will not be so exciting, maybe for uh, like uh, dynamic language implementers. Um, the interesting thing is when you add your new backends, uh, that we not only add this backend for Java, but also for the other languages, because Basically, after the conversion of Truffle EST to Crawler R, after this partial evaluation, the Crawler R looks like people, like average developers would not be able to tell the difference between a Crawler R for JavaScript versus a Crawler R for Java. It looks like a Java IR. Um, and this means actually that we can um, use this to offload for example, JavaScript to the GPU using PTX. So the Spark backend is, uh, has been, we have an experimental Spark backend, uh, who has been started by uh, Christian Tollinger, and also an experimental PTX backend by uh, Morris Meyer. And um, recently also EMD um, was uh, contributing to Crawl the HSAIL uh, backend. Uh, and again, uh, given Truffle's nature, it is not only possible to take the path of Java bytecode into these backends, but also the path from one of those dynamic languages and put your language there, kind of. So how, how yes. much do you consider this to be a JVM? I mean, there's, uh, since your bytecode is just one input of it, I mean, I still have a VM here, but it's, there's not much J in it anymore, right? Um, so the Truffle EST, so the Truffle EST interpreter is written in Java. Yeah, but that's incidental. You might have it written in Java, but not even compiled to bytecode if you didn't want to, right? I mean, yes, you need to have some initial execution format, but if it's the bytecode, it's, uh, it's almost incidental. Sure, you can define a, a more restricted bytecode if you want. And actually, uh, the, there will be a talk tomorrow also on, uh, by Christian Wimmer. Uh, on, on something that we call a substrate VM uh, that, does a s that does restrict the, what bytecodes would like, express um, in order to get a simpler version of the VM that can still execute um, Truffle and therefore can still execute, for example, the JavaScript on top of the JVM. That is correct. So we could, we do not need to base our system on the full JVM, we can base our system on a restricted set of the JVM. Yes. But if you do that, can you still use Java 
library? No, you would, in that case, you would have to potentially implement a Truffle interpreter for Java, right? Because essentially we are, we are adding a layer here. We could move the Java layer also up there and then have a restricted version of uh, Java bytecodes on this layer. You have to do this. Yes, yes, yes. So, so we only need a subset of the GVM. It just happens that the GVM provides us the right infrastructure at the moment to run these things without like creating a VM. Okay, any more questions on this part? Um, if not, I will now hand over to Vasant uh, uh, to talk about his, their experiences with uh, Crawl and uh, HSEL backend. Cool, so my name is Vasant Venkatachalam. I work for the AMD Runtimes Group, and I'm pleased to talk about this new backend that we've added to the Graal JIT compiler to be able to compile Java into HSAIL so that we can support HS HSA-enabled GPU devices. So this is an overall agenda of the talk. I'm first going to talk briefly about why we're interested in GPU offload. Eric covered this a little bit already, but this will be a quick refresher. And I'm going to get into what are some spe special characteristics of Java-based GPU offload. When you're compiling Java for the GPU, what do you need to pay attention to? And then I'm going to get into Graal. Briefly, why did we choose Graal? What are some of the benefits of using Graal? And then I'll talk about the details of this backend that we've added to Graal, which generates the HSA, HSA code. And I'll also give some code examples of Java programs being converted into HSA and walk you through a little bit so that you get a feel for what HSA looks like. OK, so why are we interested in GPU offload? Because Typically, offloading the data parallel parts of a program to the GPU gains performance over running the whole program on the CPU. So why is this the case? So let's think back to the data parallel model. As Eric mentioned in the previous talk, um, you have the same computation that's being repeated multiple times over different data items. So all of the computations go, can go on in parallel on different cores. And so for example, you're squaring all of the elements of the array. So the individual square operations can all run in parallel on different cores. And the advantage of a GPU is that typically the GPU cores are a smaller form factor, so you have more cores to work with. So what are some special considerations for Java-based GPU offload? First, we need a programming model to be able to express what are the parts of a program that can be parallelized or thread safe. And as Eric already mentioned, we have the stream API constructs, namely the dot parallel construct, which allows us to easily specify that. And we chose to work with that for Sumatra instead of going off and inventing our own API. The second thing is that the JVM not only needs to generate code for the CPU and run on the CPU, it, it now also needs to generate code for the GPU. So you get into this issue of the JVM needing to generate code for multiple ISA targets while it's running on one ISA target, namely the CPU. So we call this adding multi-ISA support to the JVM. And then finally, ideally it would be good for HSA-enabled devices if the JVM emits, instead of emitting the actual target ISA for each individual GPU device, if it emits like a common intermediate format. And we call this HSAIL, actually, I'll show you. And, and as Eric already mentioned, you can think of this kind of like the bytecodes for a GPU target, in that you can, the HSAIL format, it's common intermediate format, which gets translated by the HSA runtime system into the actual GPU ISA, which runs on the GPU. And this has the advantage of portability. For HSA-enabled GPU devices, right. we, we can, you know, we that generate this ISA. Uh, Intel or NVIDIA or, I guess, other right we're, we're, right, we're specifically talking about HSA-enabled GPU but devices. The Gremlin plans to do uh, another level of abstraction or it's not possible or practical. You're, you're focusing on HSA, yeah? Right, okay. right. Right, right, right. If, if NVIDIA would like to join the HSA Foundation, that would be a great idea. Sorry? If, if NVIDIA chose to join the HSA Foundation, that would be an awesome idea. It, it would be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's it about the NVIDIA and the HSA? 
Pardon me? What, uh, what are you talking about? I was merely making the clear comment that there were a bunch of people in the Hagestack Foundation, and if NVIDIA chose to, to, to join it, then of course they're invited. Okay. Support. It's an intermediate yeah. format for those people in that foundation, Qualcomm, ARM, and whatever. Okay, so why did we choose Grawl? Well, first of all, what is Grawl? You know, as Tom has already expl explained, it's a highly extensible JIT compiler, and it's written in Java. And the fact that it's written in Java gives us a lot of advantages to work with. One is that there are a number of Java development environments, Eclipse, NetBeans, which make it relatively easy to develop using Grawl and also to single step through the code and debug the code. And then the fact that it's written in Java means we can, we can practically run Grawl anywhere. And so we can treat it like a cross compiler. We can run it on one platform, namely the CPU, but compile for a different platform, the GPU. And that gives us something to work with when we go off to develop this multi-ISA framework that, that um, I talked about in the earlier slide. And finally, we had a number of discussions with the hotspot team on, okay, should we, what are our options? Should we use Grawl versus using C2? what would be the advantages and, and uh, what would be the challenges. And the, the overall consensus is that we should go with Grawl and that would be the most efficient way to come up with a fast working prototype. So a very quick HSCIL primer. HSCIL, again, this is the code that this backend is going to emit. And um, it gets translated to the actual GPU target ISA by a runtime layer known as the finalizer. It's all part of the HSA runtime stack. And the generated code is an ASCII text form, which makes it very simple to debug. And so I have here an example of a multiplication operation. It's pretty straightforward to understand, but you can see I've broken up the instruction into different pieces here. We have the mnemonic first. So in place of mall, I could have had an addition, add, sub, or, or div, for example. And we have a type modifier, which tells you what data type we're working with. So there are different type modifiers, like s is signed integer, u is unsigned integer, b is bit, and f is floating point value. And then there's a length modifier, because different data types have different ranges of lengths that they can work with. So you know, I've given a, listed a whole bunch of ranges. Not all of them apply to this example, but just, to, just for completeness. And then we have the parameters. Usually the destination comes first. And these are all registers, by the way. So we have the destination registers followed by two source registers. And this is just a brief legend. You know, there are different, there are different registers in the register models. We have eight control registers, and these are known as C registers, 32 128-bit registers, known as Q registers. 64, 64-bit registers, so the D registers, and then 128, 32-bit registers. These are all S registers. You can read more about that in the, in the HSA spec. Are the registers separate, or do they alias two single functions or double and two double functions apply? These are separate. Okay. So that's a little primer on HSAIL. And now we get into how does, where does Grawl fit into the picture? And how does Grawl work with the runtime stack in the overall execution of a, of a Java program? So what we have on this slide is the overall workflow that a Java program passes through. So you start with the bytecodes, and we feed that as input into Grawl. And Grawl has its intermediate representations. And it performs optimizations. And then the back end generates the HSAIL code. And then at the bottom, we have a runtime layer. This is part of the HSA runtime stack, which takes the HSA IL code and then converts that into the, or translates that into the actual GPU ISA target. And because this is in Java and this is, this is running on the native hardware, um, we have a JNI layer that interfaces, connects up Grawl with, with the runtime stack. And then finally, the target ISA run can be run either on a simulator or on hardware. And we're currently testing on both. We have internal hardware that, that we're working with in addition to using a simulator. So the overall development status, we have checked in this HSAIL backend code generation support into the public branch. And there are a number of features that supports the basic arithmetic operations, loads and stores, convert operations, 
mapping for common intrinsics, such as math.squareRoot. We have support for register spilling. We have also recently added support for loads and stores that use compressed references, in addition to regular loads and stores. And we also support compilation of Java Lambda and Stream API intrinsics. And this is, Eric has already talked about this. Um, but one point I will mention is that the development environments we're currently using, mostly just Eclipse. Eclipse does not support Java 8 yet. And so we would like to get that support. We'd like to see support in Eclipse for Java 8 pretty soon so that we can get our Java 8 related test cases checked into the public branch. Because currently we just have the Java 7 related test cases checked in. But we have all of the functionality that needed to handle the Java 8 Lambda constructs. Those have all been checked into the uh, public branch. So it's all there. And uh, there are a number of areas of work that are in progress. Function call support, actually, I have, um, these slides are a couple of weeks old. I have actually added some basic function call support. And I have some basic, some test cases working that are, do some basic static and virtual method calls. And that support is currently being tested. And we would also like to create an HCIL aware register allocator instead of using the current x86 engine, which is what's currently supplying the register numbers is coming from the x86 engine. And we're taking the x86 numbers and, and uh, mapping them to the HCIL registers. And we thought that would be a good starting point. But we're, we're looking to decouple the x86 from the HSAIL backend and use our own register allocator. So there's some work to be done there. And then emitting useful annotations alongside the code generated, like what parts of a Java source did this HSIL code come from, um, or debugging information. These things would be useful to emit alongside the code that's being generated. So testing coverage. So since it's a relatively new project, we the test Test examples are working, are, are expanding. We're gradually expanding our testing coverage. So far, we have over 130 test cases, and demo applications working. These exercise both Java 8 and Java 7 constructs. Although, as I mentioned, we currently the ones that have been checked into the public branch just exercise the Java 7 constructs. Um, we're waiting for the Java 8 support again to be to be included into Eclipse before we check every all of that code in. And we have been testing on both the simulator as well as prototype AMD hardware. A little bit about the simulator I'll mention. It's available. It's open source. It's available at the HSA Foundation GitHub repository. And uh, it supports a number of useful debugging features, such as single stepping and viewing the HCIL registers. And there's an interface called Okra, which Eric already mentioned, which we're using to interface with the simulator. And you can get more details about the simulator at this web page. OK, so now we get into some fun stuff. So what does the HSAIL code look like for a simple Java program? So this is a pretty simple program where we're squaring all of the elements of an array. And so we have an in-stream for, for loop here, which squares the elements and then assigns them to an output array. So what the compiler sees out of this lambda example is a method that looks something like this. It takes three parameters. And the first two parameters are what are known as the captured parameters. These are the input array in and the output array out. And the third parameter is the parameter i, which is being fed into this lambda expression. So normally what would happen is that the JVM would invoke this method separately over different ranges of that value i, the third parameter. But since we're compiling for the GPU, what we intend to do instead is execute this body of code in parallel, in, in separate work items. So one of the things about a work item, Eric already went through this, is, is that each work item has its own unique ID. And so we can actually use that work item ID to index into this array. So that behaves as essentially this variable i that's parameter i that's being passed in here. And there's a unique, there's an instruction for that called work item apps ID. So if you look through the code, I'll walk you through this a little bit. We have parameter passing up here. The input and output array are being loaded into registers. And we have the work item ID being retrieved. So we can use that as an index into the array. And the rest of the code is pretty straightforward. I've 
you know, I've put commented out really what are the main sections of the code where you know, we're loading the input array, we're doing the multiplication, we're storing to the output array. One thing that I should mention is that in the array parameter, when an array is being passed as a parameter, we're actually passing the whole array. And this includes all of the metadata, the header data that goes along with the array. So when you actually want to reference an array element, we need to skip over that metadata. And that's why you're seeing some values being added here, namely the 24 being added to skip past the header data so that we can get to the actual array element. So it's pretty straightforward code. And this gives you a feel for what does the HSAL code look like for a sample Java program. Is that the source string that sends the triple API? Is that I, I didn't quite hear. You're using the triple API. Is that a source string? I'm, this is, we're, not using, we're not using the truffle API in this, in this code example. We're going straight from Java bytecodes right into the uh, compilation of those bytecodes into the IR. And you know, this, this takes a different path. Okay. So this is a slightly more complicated example. This is part of the code generated for a Mandelbrot, namely, I'm sure you all know Mandelbrot from seeing this, this figure here, what the example generates. But this is just a loop body of the Mandelbrot example. And I thought I'd show you this because this exercises a number of different operations here. We have multiplication, we have addition. Um, you know, we have some condition, conditional branches happening here, loops. And um, so just notice, I've already commented, you know, the lines of the code. You can, you know, you can walk through this on your own. But just notice that, you know, all of these operations that are on the right-hand side are, are in here. We have the multiplications. We have subtraction. We have addition. We have, you know, we have the loops, the loop headers. Um, so that's just to give you an, give you an idea that we're, we are able to handle multiple, you know, more complicated programs that, that exercise multiple operations at once. So the thing I wanted to point out also with this example is that Grawl is in, smart enough to do some optimizations here. For example, notice that count is initially zero and max iterations is set to a, a value 64. And because count is zero, Grawl, Grawl detects this. So it does not need to do a check. This check of whether count is less than max iterations, it does not need to do that the very first time through this loop. So it moves that check down to the very end over here. This S0, this compare operation over here. And then another thing you'll notice is that Grawl is pretty smart about its use of registers. So for example, this hefty computation over here of new ZX, it stores the, re it stores the result of that in S20. And the next time around, in the next iteration of the loop, it does not have to repeat that, this computation all over again. It knows that the value is already in S20, so we can reuse it up here. Go ahead. OK, we're almost done. So, so actually, there are opportunities to vectorize this part of the code. Um, so we're. We meaning, you know, we, we haven't currently implemented the vectorization. That is, I haven't implemented. Um, I'm currently not analyzing this, this part of the code and vectorizing it. This is just, this is actually part of a larger program, which each instance of that program is being run in parallel, you know, you know in, in a separate work item on the GPU. So I haven't showed the whole program that this comes with. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's not, I, I haven't implemented vector instructions yet in, 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 um, you know, in my back end. But um, as it can, there is work to be done. So that's pretty much it. This is a quick summary. GPU offload is beneficial for improved performance and power savings. And we have contributed an HSIL back end to Grawl, which can do a number of things, has a number of features. We are supporting a variety of Java 8 and Java 7 test cases, which we've been running on simulator as well as hardware. And this work allows JVMs to compile for HSA IL enabled GPU devices. So we would encourage feedback from the OpenJDK community, and we encourage further contributions to this work. Um, as we mentioned, there's a lot of work to be done. 
lot of potential here. Question?